Is Pope Francis and the Vatican creating a one world religion? In previous videos, we have already seen numerous popes over the last few decades condemn religious relativism, indifferentism, and that we are to preach the gospel and evangelize. The Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue itself has explicitly said this. But is Pope Francis different? Is Pope Francis the outlier? Usually the people who attack the Catholic Church and John Paul II regarding interreligious dialogue and pushing the conspiracy theory claims of a one world religion are the same people who attack Pope Francis for very similar reasons. Now, in previous videos, we have already seen that the claims they push are ridiculous and what they accuse the Catholic Church and numerous popes of is explicitly condemned by the very individuals they accuse. So based on a track record of how people are guilty of rash judgment, misrepresentation and slander, when you hear the accusations against Pope Francis, you should immediately be suspicious. They have already proven themselves to be not reliable sources. You know when an internet atheist spams the most generic supposed Bible contradictions and every time you look at it, the claims are just shallow thinking and then the next time they make a claim, you just don't really expect anything of value. It is almost like that. This is going to be a pretty long video, but watch until the end because this is going to be very comprehensive and just packed with information because I really want to make this video definitive where I can just put it behind me and where people can just link others to this video and then that's it. Nothing more is required. And the video will also contain very valuable information for each one of us, which we need to be able to keep in mind, so stay tuned. Usually anti-Catholics have tried to support their claims against Pope Francis by saying Pope Francis condemns proselytism. Proselytism just means to convert someone. It is evangelism. In other words, people interpret the word proselytism in a neutral sense. But as we will see, this is not what Pope Francis means by the word proselytism. Consider the following document from the CDF which Pope Benedict XVI approved and published in 2007. In the Christian context, the term proselytism was often used as a synonym for missionary activity. More recently, however, the term has taken on a negative connotation to mean the promotion of a religion by using means and for motives contrary to the spirit of the gospel, that is, which do not safeguard the freedom and dignity of the human person. It is in this sense that the term proselytism is understood in the context of the ecumenical movement. The CDF also said that proclaiming the truth requires the avoidance of any undue pressure. In spreading religious faith and introducing religious practices, everyone should refrain at all times from any kind of action which might seem to suggest coercion or dishonest or improper persuasion especially when dealing with poor or uneducated people. The witness to the truth does not seek to impose anything by force, neither by coercive action nor by tactics incompatible with the gospel. By definition, the exercise of charity is free. Love and witnessing to the truth are aimed above all at convincing others through the power of the word of God. The Christian mission resides in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the truth which is proclaimed. Bishop Arthur Seratelli of Patterson, New Jersey, similarly defined the new meaning of proselytism as follows. Pope Francis's strong language is directed at the modern meaning of proselytism. This meaning includes using any type of pressure to convert someone, whether it is moral, political or economic. It means caricaturing with unfair criticism the belief of others. Proselytism in its present meaning includes inducing people by offering them any kind of assistance, such as food, education, shelter or clothing. In each of these cases, proselytism is wrong because it does not respect the freedom of the other. However, while these methods of making converts is sinful, inviting others to the fullness of truth is not only wrong, but is truly an act of love. 
In other words, in recent times, proselytism has taken the meaning of promoting religion by using illicit means and impure motives. Pressuring, coercion and things like this is not allowed. Now let's take a look at what Pope Francis has said on this in a bit more detail. Next came a question from Bendito Negozo. Question. Some Protestant sects use the promise of wealth and prosperity to make proselytes. The poor become fascinated and hope to become rich by adhering to these sects that use the name of the gospel. That's how they leave the church. What recommendation can you give us that our evangelization is not proselytism? Pope Francis replied, what you say is very important. To start with, we must distinguish carefully between the different groups who are identified as Protestants. There are many with whom we can work very well. But there are others who only try to proselytize and use a theological vision of prosperity. You were very specific in your question. There are sects that cannot really be defined as Christian. They preach Christ, yes, but their message is not Christian. It has nothing to do with the preaching of a Lutheran or any other serious evangelical Christianity. These so-called evangelicals preach prosperity. They promise a gospel that does not know poverty, but simply seeks to make proselytes. This is exactly what Jesus condemns in the Pharisees of his time. I have said it many times. Proselytism is not Christian. Today I felt a certain bitterness after a meeting with young people. A woman approached me with a young man and a young woman. I was told that they were part of a slightly fundamentalist movement. She said to me in perfect Spanish, Your Holiness, I am from South Africa. This boy was a Hindu and converted to Catholicism. This girl was Anglican and converted to Catholicism. But she told me in a triumphant way, as though she was showing off a hunting trophy. I felt uncomfortable and said to her, Madam, evangelization? Yes. Proselytism? No. What I mean is that evangelization is free. Proselytism, on the other hand, makes you lose your freedom. Proselytism is incapable of creating a religious path in freedom. It always seeks people being subjugated in one way or another. In evangelization, the protagonist is God. In proselytism, it is the I. So proselytism makes people subjugated. It places the focus on the self instead of God. You make yourself the protagonist. Obviously, this has nothing to do whether you preach the word of God or not, because preaching the gospel doesn't mean anyone is subjugated and that they aren't in freedom. And as in the example Pope Francis provided, the problem was the woman's attitude itself, her displaying them triumphantly as a hunting trophy. That is what Pope Francis considers to be proselytism, making up the numbers. Pope Francis has no problem with these people converting. His problem was the woman's attitude. Her attitude is what makes something proselytism. Furthermore, Pope Francis explicitly connects proselytism with those groups who preach the prosperity gospel. So this tells you that preaching the gospel is not the issue. It is the other content, factors and attitudes that is the problem. Pope Francis continued, of course, there are many forms of proselytism. The one practiced by soccer teams, acquiring fans, is all right, obviously. And then it is clear that there are other forms of proselytism for commerce and business, for political parties. Proselytism is widespread, we know that. But it doesn't have to be the case with us. We must evangelize, which is very different from proselytizing. In other words, we need to evangelize we shouldn't just do it to maximize numbers, that is the wrong focus. Evangelization is essentially witness. Proselytizing is convincing, but it is all about membership and takes away your freedom. Benedict XVI said something wonderful, that the church does not grow by proselytism, it grows by attraction. The attraction of witness. The sects, on the other hand, making proselytes separate people promising them many advantages and then leaving them to themselves. Proselytizing is illicit means of convincing people, just doing it to make up the numbers, not having the right attitude, not truly attracting them to the love of Jesus, promising people things and then leaving them alone. 
You convince people not through proclaiming the gospel through your life and your words. Instead, you convince people with the motivation of stacking the numbers. Not all kinds of convincing is bad, obviously not. But proselytizing, where the convincing is illicit and your intentions are not pure, that is what takes someone's freedom away. I ask you to study and deepen the difference between proselytism and evangelization. Read well Evangelium Diandi of Pope Paul VI. There it is clear that the vocation of the Church is to evangelize. Indeed, the very identity of the Church involves evangelizing. Evangelization is the inward growth and spreading of the Gospel through love, while proselytism is just the outer appearance of things. Evangelizers never violate the conscience. They announce, sow and help to grow. They help. Whoever proselytizes, on the other hand, violates people's conscience. This does not make them free. It makes them dependent. Evangelization gives you a dependence, that is, makes you free and able to grow. Proselytizing gives you a servile dependence at the level of the conscience and society. The dependence of the evangelized person, the paternal dependence, is the memory of the grace that God has given you. The proselyte instead depends not as a child, but as a slave, who in the end does not know what to do unless he or she is told. Pope Francis is clear that evangelization does not violate someone's conscience. When you announce the gospel, it does not violate someone's conscience. It is when you use illicit means of convincing where it violates someone's conscience. This year, Pope Francis delivered the following speeches. To evangelize is not to proselytize. To proselytize is something pagan. It is neither religious nor evangelical. This is not about proselytism, as I said, so that others become one of us. No, this is not Christian. It is about loving so that they might be happy children of God. It is not about getting people on our team. It is about bringing them to the truth to experience God's love and being transformed by God's love. Pope Francis also said the following on the 11th of January. Not to communicate ourselves, but communicate in Jesus, with a gaze, with gestures. This is attraction, the opposite of proselytism. This means that the one who proclaims God cannot proselytize, no, cannot pressure others, no, but relieve them, not impose burdens, but take them away, bearing peace, not bearing God. Pope Francis also said that the passion for evangelization is an urgent and decisive theme for Christian life. It is a vital dimension for the Church. The community of Jesus' disciples was in fact born apostolic, born missionary, not proselytizing. And from the start, we had to make this distinction. Being missionary, being apostolic, evangelizing is not the same as proselytizing. They have nothing to do with one another. So Pope Francis is clear that there is a distinction between evangelizing and proselytizing. Pope Francis considers Jesus' disciples to be apostolic, missionary, and that they evangelized. Did the disciples of Jesus preach the gospel in public, going from town to town? Yes. Does Pope Francis know that? Of course. Pope Francis approves of this. Elsewhere, he literally said, after having seen in Jesus the model and teacher of proclamation, we turn today to the first disciples to what the disciples did. The Gospel says that Jesus appointed twelve to be with him and to be sent out to preach. Two things, to be with him and to send them to preach. Pope Francis also said that when Christian life loses sight of the horizon of evangelization, the horizon of proclamation, it grows sick. Matthew returns to his environment. But he returns there changed and with Jesus. His apostolic zeal does not begin in a new, pure place, an ideal place far away, but instead he begins there where he lives, with the people he knows. Here is the message for us. We do not have to wait until we are perfect and have come a long way following Jesus to bear witness to him. No, our proclamation begins today, there where we live. And he does not begin by trying to convince others, not to convince, but by bearing witness every day to the beauty of the love that has looked upon us and has lifted us up. And it is this beauty, communicating this beauty, that will convince people. Not communicating ourselves, but the Lord himself. 
We are the ones who proclaim the Lord. We do not proclaim ourselves. We do not proclaim a political party, an ideology. No, we proclaim Jesus. We need to put Jesus in contact with the people, without convincing them, but allowing the Lord to do the convincing. For as Pope Benedict taught us, the Church does not engage in proselytism. Instead, she grows by attraction. Do not forget this. When you see Christians proselytizing, making a list of people to come, they are not Christians. They are pagans disguised as Christians. But the heart is pagan. The Church grows not by proselytism, it grows by attraction. Pope Francis is saying that communicating Jesus is what convinces people. We don't proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus. We don't convince or use illicit means of convincing, we allow Jesus to convince people. Ultimately, we are not the ones doing convincing. It is Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in the heart of people, convicting them, bringing them to conversion. The Church does not proselytize, it attracts. Pope Benedict said the same as Pope Francis. And yet, despite being against proselytization, Pope Benedict XVI is clear that people are to preach the Gospel. Consider what Pope Benedict said in Verbum Domini in 2010. We need, then, to discover ever anew the urgency and the beauty of the proclamation of the Word. The Lord offers salvation to men and women in every age. It is not a matter of preaching a word of consolation, but rather a word which disrupts, which calls to conversion, and which opens the way to an encounter with the One through whom a new humanity flowers. Since the entire people of God is a people which has been sent, the Synod reaffirmed that the mission of proclaiming the Word of God is the task of all of the disciples of Jesus Christ based on their baptism. No believer in Christ can feel dispensed from this responsibility. The Church, as a mystery of communion, is thus entirely missionary, and everyone according to his or her proper state in life is called to give an incisive contribution to the proclamation of Christ. It is important that every form of proclamation keep in mind, first of all, the intrinsic relationship between the communication of God's Word and Christian witness. The very credibility of our proclamation depends on this. On the one hand, the Word must communicate everything that the Lord Himself has told us. On the other hand, it is indispensable, through witness, to make this Word credible, lest it appear merely as a beautiful philosophy or utopia rather than a reality that can be lived and itself give life. There is a close relationship between the testimony of Scripture as the self-attestation of God's Word and the witness given by the lives of believers. One implies and leads to the other. Christian witness communicates the Word attested in the Scriptures. For their part, the Scriptures explain the witness which Christians are called to give by their lives. Those who encounter credible witnesses of the Gospel thus come to realize how effective God's Word can be in those who receive it. In this interplay between witness and Word, we can understand what Pope Paul VI stated, the good news proclaimed by the witness of life sooner or later has to be proclaimed by the Word of life. There is no true evangelization unless the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, are proclaimed. So Pope Benedict explicitly ordered Catholics to evangelize, to preach Jesus and the Gospel to everyone, despite being against proselytization as well. Why? Because proselytization has taken a different meaning in recent times. Now let's take a look at what Pope Francis said in 2013. I recommend just reading the whole thing, specifically the following paragraph numbers on the screen, but I don't want to make this too repetitive, so I will try my best to cut things out as much as I can. We cannot forget that evangelization is first and foremost about preaching the gospel to those who do not know Jesus Christ or who have always rejected him. All of them have a right to receive the gospel. Christians have the duty to proclaim the gospel without excluding anyone. Instead of seeming to impose new obligations, they should appear as people who wish to share their joy who point to a horizon of beauty and who invite others to a delicious banquet. It is not by proselytizing that the Church grows, but by attraction. John Paul II asked us to recognize that there must be no listening of the impetus to preach the Gospel to those who are far from Christ, because this is the first task of the Church. Indeed, 
today missionary activity still represents the greatest challenge for the Church, and the missionary task must remain foremost. Along these lines, the Latin American bishops state that we cannot passively and calmly wait in our church buildings. We need to move from a pastoral ministry of mere conservation to a decidedly missionary pastoral ministry. Evangelization takes place in obedience to the missionary mandate of Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. In these verses we see how the risen Christ sent his followers to preach the gospel in every time and place, so that faith in him might spread to every corner of the earth. In our day, Jesus' command to go and make disciples echoes in the changing scenarios and ever new challenges to the Church's vision of evangelization, and all of us are called to take part in this new missionary going forth. Each Christian and every community must discern the path that the Lord Jesus points out, but all of us are asked to obey his call and to go forth from our own comfort zone in order to reach all the peripheries in need of the light of the gospel. The drive to go forth and give, to go out from ourselves, to keep pressing forward in our sowing of the good seed, remains ever present. It is vitally important for the church to go forth and preach the gospel to all, to all places, on all occasions, without hesitation, reluctance or fear. The joy of the gospel is for all people. No one can be excluded. All of this has great relevance for the preaching of the gospel. If we are really concerned to make its beauty more clearly recognized and accepted by all, let us go forth then, let us go forth to offer everyone the life of Jesus Christ. Here I repeat for the entire church what I have often said to the priest and laity of Buenos Aires. I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. In the prevailing culture, priority is given to the outward, the immediate, the visible, the quick, the superficial and the provisional. What is real gives way to appearances. In many countries, globalization has meant a hastened deterioration of their own cultural roots and the invasion of ways of thinking and acting proper to other cultures which are economically advanced but ethically debilitated. Ouch, seems like Pope Francis has identified some really bad things as a result of globalization. The individualism of our postmodern and globalized era favors a lifestyle which weakens the development and stability of personal relationships and distorts family bonds. Shh, Pope Francis, stop identifying bad things with globalization. You are supposed to be a globalist according to the Facebook tinfoil hat society. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Pope Francis continues. After having considered some of the challenges of the present, I would now like to speak of the task which bears upon us in every age and place. For there can be no true evangelization without the explicit proclamation of Jesus as Lord, and without the primacy of the proclamation of Jesus Christ in all evangelizing work. Acknowledging the concerns of the Asian bishops, John Paul II told them that if the Church is to fulfill its providential destiny, evangelization as the joyful, patient and progressive preaching of the saving death and resurrection of Jesus Christ must be your absolute priority. These words hold true for all of us. In virtue of their baptism, all the members of the people of God have become missionary disciples. All the baptized are agents of evangelization. The new evangelization calls for personal involvement on the part of each of the baptized. Every Christian is challenged, here and now, to be actively engaged in evangelization. Let us look at those first disciples who immediately after encountering the gaze of Jesus went forth to proclaim him joyfully, we have found the Messiah. The Samaritan woman became a missionary immediately after speaking with Jesus and many Samaritans came to believe in him because of the woman's testimony. So too Saint Paul, after his encounter with Jesus Christ, immediately proclaimed Jesus. So what are we waiting for? Today, as the Church seeks to experience a profound missionary renewal, there is a kind of preaching that falls on all of us as a daily responsibility. 
It has to do with bringing the gospel to the people we meet, whether they be our neighbors or complete strangers. This is the informal preaching, which takes place in the middle of a conversation, something along the lines of what a missionary does when visiting a home. Being a disciple means being constantly ready to bring the love of Jesus to others. In this preaching, which is always respectful and gentle, the first step is personal dialogue. When the other person speaks and shares his or her joys, hopes and concerns for loved ones, or so many other heartfelt needs, only afterwards is it possible to bring up God's word, perhaps by reading a Bible verse or relating a story, but always keeping in mind the fundamental message, the personal love of God who became man, who gave himself up for us, who is living and who offers us his salvation and his friendship. This message has to be shared humbly as a testimony on the part of the one who is always willing to learn. In the awareness that the message is so rich and so deep that it always exceeds our grasp. At times the message can be presented directly, at times by way of a personal witness or gesture, or in a way which the Holy Spirit may suggest in that particular situation. If it seems prudent and if the circumstances are right, this fraternal missionary encounter could end with a brief prayer, related to the concerns which the person may have expressed. In this way they will have an experience of being listened to and understood. They will know that their particular situation has been placed before God, and that God's word really speaks to their lives. Jesus wants evangelizers who proclaim the good news not only with words, but above all by a life transfigured by God's presence. It is impossible to persevere in a fervent evangelization unless we are convinced from personal experience that it is not the same thing to have known Jesus as not to have known him, not the same thing to walk with him as to walk blindly, not the same thing to hear his word as not to know it, and not the same thing to contemplate him, to worship him, to find our peace in him as not to. It is not the same thing to try to build the world with his gospel as try to do so by our own. We know well that with Jesus life becomes richer and that with him it is easier to find meaning in everything. This is why we evangelize. A true missionary who never ceases to be a disciple knows that Jesus walks with him, speaks to him, breathes with him, works with him. He senses Jesus alive with him in the midst of the missionary enterprise. Unless we see him present at the heart of our missionary commitment, our enthusiasm soon wanes and we are no longer sure of what it is that we are handing on. We lack vigor and passion. A person who is not convinced, enthusiastic and certain and in love will convince nobody. In other words, Pope Francis says that you need to be convinced, you need to be enthusiastic, you need to be certain, you need to be in love with Jesus. Only then will other people be convinced as well and accept the gospel. Pope Francis also said the following in 2013, Father, now I understand, it is a question of convincing others of proselytizing. No, it is nothing of the kind. The gospel is like seed. You scatter it, you scatter it with your words and with your witness. The joy of sowing with our witness, for with words alone it is not enough. It is not enough. Words without witness are hot air. Words do not suffice. It must be the true witness that Paul speaks of. All the peripheries, all the crossroads on the way go there, and so dare the seed of the gospel with your words and your witness. Now let's take a quick look at what Pope Francis has said about other religions. Dialogue does not mean renouncing one's own identity when it goes against another's, nor does it mean compromising Christian faith and morals. To the contrary, True openness involves remaining steadfast in one's deepest convictions, clear and joyful in one's own identity, and therefore open to understanding the religion of others, capable of respectful human relationships, convinced that the encounter with someone different than ourselves can be an occasion of growth in a spirit of fraternity, of enrichment and of witness. This is why interreligious dialogue and evangelization are not mutually exclusive but rather nourish one another. We do not impose anything. We do not employ any subtle strategies for attracting believers. Rather, we bear witness to what we believe and who we are with joy and simplicity. In fact, an encounter wherein each party sets aside his beliefs, 
pretending to renounce what he holds most dear, would certainly not be an authentic relationship. In this case, we could speak of a false fraternity. As disciples of Jesus, we have to make every effort to triumph over fear, always ready to take the first step, without becoming discouraged in the face of difficulty and misunderstanding. It is widely thought that coexistence is only possible by hiding one's own religious affiliation, by meeting in a kind of a neutral space, devoid of references of transcendence. But here too, how would it be possible to create true relationships, to build a society that is a common home, by imposing that each person set aside what he considers to be an intimate part of his very being? It is impossible to think of a fraternity being born in a laboratory. Of course, it is necessary that all things be done while respecting the conviction of others and of unbelievers. But we must have the courage and patience to come together as we are, to futurize in the respectful coexistence of diversity, not in homologation to a single theoretically neutral way of thought. Pope Francis has also said the following regarding interreligious dialogue in 2013. It is true that certain Christian beliefs are unacceptable to Judaism, and that the Church cannot refrain from proclaiming Jesus as Lord and Messiah. An attitude of openness in truth and in love must characterize the dialogue with the followers of non-Christian religions. In spite of various obstacles and difficulties, especially forms of fundamentalism on both sides, and Pope Francis says that interreligious dialogue is a necessary condition for peace in the world and that it is about serving justice and peace, social peace and justice and an ethical commitment. In this dialogue, ever friendly and sincere, attention must always be paid to the essential bond between dialogue and proclamation, which leads the Church to maintain and intensify her relationship with non-Christians. A facile syncretism would ultimately be a totalitarian gesture on the part of those who would ignore greater values of which they are not the masters. True openness involves remaining steadfast in one's deepest convictions, clear and joyful in one's own identity, while at the same time being open to understanding those of the other party and knowing that dialogue can enrich each side. What is not helpful is a diplomatic openness which is yes to everything in order to avoid problems, for this would be a way of deceiving others and denying them the good which we have been given to share generously with others. Evangelization and interreligious dialogue, far from being opposed, mutually support and nourish one another. And that is what Pope Francis has said about other religions and interreligious dialogue. As with previous popes, he is not creating a one-world religion. He literally condemns that. And he explicitly affirms that people need to evangelize. People need to become Catholic. Thank you for watching. God bless.